What's up, Moto Buddies? Mike here, Taco Moto Co. Uh, got a bike. This is a really cool one. I was happy to uh, see how well this thing turned out. This is a bike that we put together specifically for a vet rider. This is a, a guy who is very, very experienced uh, motorcyclist and has a lot of ADV type bikes. And this is not his first dirt bike, but he really wanted to do a dirt bike project that was pretty unique. Uh, very, very functional. Everything on this bike is specifically designed and sort of like dialed in for this vet rider. And it was even put together with this whole purpose in mind of uh, having him run the LA B to V, uh, which he finished and had a great time on. And this bike, um, when he brought it back for an after ride service and a couple of extra things, just uh, was pretty stoked, pretty thrilled at how well it did. And some of the things that are on this bike, um, were really thought through to make him, to give him more uh, years on the bike. So a lot of times when we think through a project, we might have performance in mind, we might have some you know, specific features and goals that we're after with a, with a project. On this one, what we wanted to do was put together a package to give this vet rider more years of, of, of riding. So we did things like a Recluse CX clutch, and you know, you get on the forums and the boards and there's trash talkers and trolls who will say, you know, if, if you need a recluse, then you need a riding school. You need to become a better rider. Well, you know, not everybody has natural talent. Not everybody grew up as a kid riding a bike. Not everybody has full strength with their left hand and their clutch. Some guys do things like put on a mountain, uh, Midwest mountain engineering clutch lever to give them, you know, more, more mechanical leverage in the and the clutch lever. There's all kinds of ways that a guy might have just fatigue um, or lack of attention or just he has uh, lost some of that edge, right? Not all of us are 21. Not all of us uh, have a lifetime of moto experience. Uh, some guys only ride a couple times a year. Um, there's also benefits with the recluse clutch in the fact that the, the uh, steel plates are specifically designed to pull oil into themselves and a recluse runs cooler. The engine oil gets less friction, less heat, there's less slippage. Uh, the recluse bikes, we've been oil testing and are finding that we can, um, we can recommend interval, oil change intervals with a really good high quality oil. So use, use a, a proper MA rated oil, something um, high grade. And we are finding that the numbers are telling us that uh, you can go as high as 30, 40, even up to 50 hours in certain ride conditions. If you're a dual sport guy, you're doing like some BDR type roads and you're not putting a lot of demand on the clutch. I'm, I'm comfortable telling guys run a really good oil and run it up to 50 hours if you need to. So um, I think personally for me, I would probably be changing my oil on a like a BDR bike maybe in the 30 to 40 range, but if you needed to squeak it up to 50, I'm fine giving that recommendation because um, our oil testing numbers are telling us that with the recluse clutch and a really good oil, um, you, you can do that. So there's just, there's certain advantages to certain products, to certain ways of setting up a bike that lend themselves to a particular outcome, a particular you know, desired goal. Um, again, I say this all the time, there's lots of great formulas out there. There's lots of ways, you know, you can trick up a bike and bling up a bike. And if that's exactly what you're after and you know what that product does and how it affects the overall package and you expect that result and you want that result, then that's the way to go for you. Um, so many guys just flip through the parts catalog, see something blingy, see something cool, see something that their buddies ride. They'll throw it out on their bike and they may they may not know that they have gone backwards. You know, they, 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 they hoped, they thought that by had a, having a specific component on there that that would give them some sort of desired outcome. And in fact, it may be the exact wrong thing for that rider uh, for his use. And so, you know, a lot of guys will listen to their bros and not the pros and they'll throw junk on their bike or they'll go to the dealership. Not a knock, not a ding, but you know, it's a, uh, oftentimes it's a kid with a flat brim hat and he has a boss who's telling him, you know, sell this particular product, or we have a deal with this rep and this manufacturer, and this is what we sell, this is what we offer. This, this, this. So, so many times guys will end up with a bike that is ill-suited to what they're trying to do. And here's an example of a very, very uh, specifically tailored machine that is exactly right for this rider. Um, and there'll be future improvements too that'll, that'll refine this, make it even more um, 
more tailored to what this gentleman is specifically after. But anyway, just to kind of um, run through this thing really quick, if we start at the back, we do this on a lot of bikes. We like the enduro plates, great product, great guys who do it. The idea here behind this is when you take a digger, your plate moves around instead of breaking off or bending up, which is super common. Back on the tidy tail, this is our, our own in-house design, the Takamotoko tidy tail. And what we get there is the um, brake, run, and then turn signal functions all in this one integrated housing. So we don't run external turn signals. They're all built in, cleans up the rear end. There's nothing to melt. Um, a lot of guys will have their stock muffler, will burn their stock signals. And so we get rid of that problem. You can run this. You could be running a stock exhaust here on this bike with the tidy tail. And again, no turn signals, no external turn signals. There's nothing to break, nothing to snap off. And then there's no wires down here, which is a really common issue. You know, you've, you've got a monkey around and screw out drilling holes, fishing wires through. I've repaired tons and tons of bikes where um, they'll, the guys will pinch their wires up here. I've seen guys screw the, the, the screw here through their wire loom and short and just all kinds of, you know, issues. So with this tidy tail, it's plug and play. You don't need to be an electrician. You don't have to do any mods. You just pull off the old one and install the new one. And what's really cool about this is a 21, but for the 20 plus bikes, KTM got really smart and they use a global under fender. This, this black piece here is called the under fender. And instead of having a US spec under fender and a Euro spec under fender, I guess it'd be everywhere about the US. <clears throat> what they did is they designed only one single under fender and then in the U.S., there's a secondary component that bolts to that, and that makes that the U.S.-specific bike. And so uh, this is a very clever design. You just pull off that U.S. component, and then you can throw on. You don't have to do the enduro plate. Some guys won't use a plate mount at all. They'll just... I've seen guys that'll take their license plate, and they'll mount it in that, uh, that portrait. Uh, I guess it'd be landscape. They mount it in the landscape direction orientation. Screw it right to the under fender. Also, Sickass has a nice, hard, sturdy license plate holder so the enduro plate has the flexible uh, piece of you know reinforced rubber with the with the magnets if you had the sick ass it's just this hard nylon plate right here that's hard screwed to the under fender there's no give there's no budge to it any of those are great options we like them all uh, I'm probably more partial to the enduro plate uh, all right, so on this back tire right here this is the motos motas however you want to say it this is the uh, mountain hybrid and some of the reasons why I think this is a really great tire is the fact that with this tire, it's, it's, um, it's a great dual sport tire and huge life. I've seen these in Mexico go 2,000 miles. Uh, really great tire, good sidewall, natural um, synthetic uh, blend. They use natural rubber and synthetic rubber compound blend. That's very clever and innovative. So Motaz does a really good job with this tire. It's not for everybody. It does tend to be uh, loose, so that, what that would feel like is if you're riding on a fire road, and that's, that's uh, like a non-banked flat fire road, gravel road, it will be a little loose and sketchy if you're hot on the throttle. It does not have the bite as, say, like a motocross tread tire does. It takes a little longer to get on top of sand, uh, mud. It's got some conditions where it's not favorable or ideal. However, out here in the desert, we don't have any problems with that other than maybe some sand. And if you just understand what its limitations are um, and you're aware of that, it's a great tire. I like it. Um, we use it. This, this tire, I think, is working well for this rider for some of those reasons. Um, we've waited out the, um, the rim lock, uh, and you can get these from us pre-configured with whatever rim lock you have. So if you have tubeless, we have a specifically weighted set for that. If you have stock rim lock, if you've got an aftermarket rim lock like we do on this bike with the Warp 9 rim lock there. And so these um, these come pre-packaged, pre-calibrated pre for whatever rim lock setup you have. Uh, this is a really cool thing. I like this. This is our, um, uh, I forget who makes this, but this is a little bearing protector so when you pressure wash your bike you're not going to shoot water directly into the bearings and get under the seal we've upgraded the bearings in this bike to the skf seals the wheel seals of the skf brand are superior to the stock wheel seals and then when you add this cover in here you've really you've bomb proofed your rear wheel bearings against water intrusion and then if you get a nice coating of grease and you grease through the center point of the axle because you still could get water in these little collection points or in these little gap points 
into the axle and then you'd get some water intrusion. So when you set up your rear wheel, if you just take some due care and make sure that you've got grease on the axle and in those points, then you're, you're putting luck uh, in your favor, right? To prevent water getting in there and, and trashing out your bearings. So that's a really good setup. Uh, we've got this Ayers Manufacturing rear disc guard. So there's a couple of things I like about this and a couple of things I, I don't. So just in full honesty here, I think it's, a, I think it's the, here's what I like about it. It is the strongest, most bulletproof disc guard I've seen. It mounts to the rear nut here. It's got a very beefy carrier. This component here is replaceable. So as you beat this all to hell, you can change this out. It has a nice, I don't think you can see it, but it does a nice job of having a little bit of extra extension here that goes in and covers the disc. So as you, you know, the one of the main reasons to have a disc guard in the back is the fact that your front wheel is continually pitching up, collecting, and then throwing rocks, high-speed rocks. Like it's just shooting shotgun rocks at your rear disc. And so those are continually just beating that to death and putting all kinds of nicks and dings um, into the face of the of the disc and then as that as as all these dings this flattens out that just goes through and it just it just trashes out your your brake pads so i advocate and run and like and recommend using a um a, a disc guard and this one has some some of those advantages it's got some replaceable components it's super strong and robust so if you are the kind of rider who's a maximum hard enduro, like if you're a King of Motos guy, this is probably the one I'd recommend for you because of how just freaking hardcore it is. Uh, it comes at a price though. It's the heaviest of all of the, um, and I don't want to say all, but it is, it's very heavy, super, super duper heavy. And then the other thing that uh, is an issue is if you've got tires, so if you've got this on your bike and you're out in the wilderness and you need to take off your rear tire, you need to be careful and decide what kind of tire lever you're going to use because of the stock one and then some of the aftermarket one like the motion pro t6 levers uh, may or may not fit within this tight little clearance channel here uh, to get the nut off so like when when i have these on um, bikes in the shop then i have to use a 27 millimeter socket to get on there because the motion pro t6 and none of the other shop tools that we typically use to pull these off fit and so if you've got this on your bike and you're going out in a situation where you might need to change that tire, get it off, you need to be thoughtful and prepare for some way to pull this nut off out in the field. Now, I like that it has the tick marks here. It replaces the, you know, the, the axle block on the stock bike. And I, so I, I think there's some cool things about it. Um, in the comments, let me know what you think about this particular one. I got to tell you, we don't have it on this bike, but right now my current favorite one is um, by uh, System, oh shoot, I knew I would forget it. I'll put a link in the notes below. System, uh, it's, they're out of Colorado, System Tech Racing, STR I think is what it is, and it's carbon fiber, and it's it's just got some great innovative features, and, and it's very, very light, super durable. I just ran one in Baja uh, a couple weeks ago and had some great results with it, so that's that's probably my favorite one. But I, but I do like this one, and I'm not dinging it all together. I'm just saying that it's very specialized and specific for certain riders. I'm not going to um, run this on my own personal bikes, but I think for certain guys, this is a really good one. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, let's kind of move up here. So we looked at the muffler a little bit ago. So what we've got is the Pro Motobilla end cap. And I personally run the Ultra Silent Insert on my own bikes. This one, we didn't bother because this guy's doing a lot of um, wide open desert kind of riding. And so he's not needing to worry about <clears throat> trying to abate some sound for other trail users you know, horses and hikers and things like that. So being a, being a friend of other trail users is super important and having an obnoxious loud pipe does no one any favors. It doesn't, doesn't help us as a sport. And so um, the louder your pipe, I think the uh, less of a, of a good trail user you are. Um, and so since this guy is a, you know, he's more of a dual sport guy, he's not gonna be around those kind of other, other users. So we didn't throw that in there. Uh, we just straight. So this sounds, this pipe, we also left the resonator in it. So the resonator is that ice cream cone looking thing that's down in here. And that provides a nice feedback for the low throttle angles. And this, this uh, rider wanted very mild throttle tip in. He wanted to avoid that punchy, aggressive, hard hitting motocross feel. 
that you get with a straight open pipe and so we left the resonator in if you wanted to mute that even a little further then and i do on my bikes for the uh, extreme single track riding that i do i put in the uh, the ultra silent insert which is that little sort of it's a uh, a little shaped piece uh, my hand is doing a terrible job of describing it but uh, you've seen those and if not you can go on the promoto website or our website and see what that looks like and I, I like those and I run those. We didn't do that on this bike for those reasons that I, that I just described. But the, the, the Promoto cap really looks sharp, does a great job. Uh, we're a big fan of it. It's Spark Arrestor US Forest Service approved. You can remove that <clears throat> if you want to, but there's no performance gain to be had. You can't see it on the dyno and you can't feel it in your butt. So uh, we leave them in and recommend that everyone leave them in. Uh, let's see what else do we got. So this is this is our one of our new favorite thing. It's the PC Racing Max. So Eline P3. There's a handful of guys who make a sort of a shorter version of this. Um, P3 came out with this one. It's called the Max. And what it does is it brings the guard all the way to the frame, comes all the way up around here, and then goes up about as far as you probably need to go on the front. Again, anything that you're protecting here is from rocks coming off the front tire anything you're protecting here and you can see he's got some scratches and dings this is from you know falls in this general area most guys when they dent their pipe they're going to dent them here <clears throat> this is for your pants and so i just think this is a very unique idea it's a concept that's long overdue and p3 has executed it flawlessly it fits it looks great it's tremendous now there's only one issue and that is is when you uh, have your stock oil filler cap because it's got those you know it's got the little vertical deal that that that's where you grab it and get 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 um, you turn it off right because of the height of all that you're going to have some clearance issues with the bottom here and so you've got some ways to deal with that this particular one this is one of uh, uh, you can get this from us this is a very very low profile it's probably the lowest profile of any of the oil filler caps that i've seen if you know of a one that's lower, let us know. <clears throat> We'd recommend that one, but until I find something that's thinner, this is the one we use, this is the one we sell, we like it, and it allows you to, to remove the, the oil filler cap. Another thing I've seen guys do is they'll take a Dremel and they'll sort of grind away some of the material here on the guard. Uh, I don't want to do that, and I don't want all those splinters and carbon fiber shavings and all that stuff flying around and breathing and getting in my eyes. So I just throw these thin uh, low profile caps on that solves the problem for us we talked about the recluse clutch this is the cx this is the version that comes with the recluse torque drive um, plates so we've got the recluse frictions and the recluse drives and so that gives us a couple more plates in there uh, the only here's 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 a quick thought the only real argument that i've ever heard and i don't care about the trolls who say that you're weak uh, and you don't know how to ride a bike if you're a recluse, because that's utter nonsense. I don't have time for that. But the only real valid arguments that I've ever heard against recluse um, is the fact that it's expensive, which it absolutely is. So if you're looking at this and turning up your nose because of the cost, totally valid. The other argument potentially against it, which is one that I raised, is the fact that the recluse frictions will delaminate when you have oil in your or you have water in your oil and then you run that and it will the high temperature it will steam the the friction material off the plates and that will then clog up your oil filter uh, your oil screen for the for the engine and then you'll oil starve your engine and you'll you'll potentially take out your top end uh, and i had that happen we had a bike in mexico we got some ocean water in it we had to run that bike a little bit to get it back to a place where we could uh, uh, maybe we picked it up or maybe the rider just very carefully and slowly rode that bike back in to a spot where we could start working on it. And while that was happening, we did not know that those plates were losing their friction material and getting sucked up into the, uh, into the screen. And then eventually oil starved the engine and we had to redo a top end. Uh, Recluse was great about it. They sent us some parts kind of equal to the value of the repairs. Um, but you should just know that if you're ever in a situation where you get oil in your water, do not, you cannot run that bike with milky oil. You will delaminate those plates. So if that's never going to be a concern of yours, and this, this is something that only like crazy, gnarly, you know, hardcore guys are going to worry about, guys who do deep water stream crossings. Um, so it's a very, very rare subset of people who ever need to worry about that. Um, but if that's you, you just need to hold that into consideration for that potential 
you know, time that that would happen. So what you would do if you got water in your oil is you would just not start your bike. Don't run your bike. Get that oil out of there. Change it out. You know, you'll, you'll have to run your bike to circulate the oil, drain it, circulate the oil, drain it, and you're going to be in neutral. So it's not going to be a problem. It's only when you've got heat and pressure with the water and the steaming effect that, that that's an issue. So just, just be aware of that. We've got the Ride Shop, Arizona Ride Shop foldable brake lever. Love this. It's got the nice little cleats on here. And then this thing is adjustable. So a small foot, you can slide it back. A larger foot, slide it to the front. Really cool. Molecule skid plate. We just pretty much like these on all our bikes because of the weight. So the, the strength and weight of these is really, in our opinion, as good or better than anybody else's plate. The fitment's fantastic. I think there's just um, so much going on that's great about what Seth is doing with the molecule plates. And he's got, even got a newer design. This is sort of the Gen 1. The Gen 2 that he just came out with, this particular area comes up higher and does a little better job of protecting the water cover. So this is the Gen 1 version, his Gen 2. Uh, is a little bit taller. Notice up here on the O2 sensor, we've removed that because we've got a GET ECU system in here. Let's take a quick look at that. So up here, this is our GET. And then we're running the traction control knob up there, and then we've got the MAP switch. So with the Athena GET system, uh, here's, a, here's something that guys will tell me. Sometimes I'll talk to them on the phone and they'll say, I don't need the GET because I'm not a racer. Well, this guy is absolutely not a racer. This bike is, uh, we're, we're the opposite of a racer as far as the setup of this bike goes. Um, here's what's great about the, the GET or even the, even the Vortex or any of the aftermarket ECUs. I don't care what kind of rider you are. We can custom tailor the power to, spe to be specifically suited to who you are as a rider. So if you're if you're a balls out racer and you want to podium the Baja 1000, we've got maps for you. If you're a vet rider and you want to extend your riding career another five or 10 years, then we've got maps for you. What makes the Get so versatile and as well as the, the, the Vortex, but I think the, I think the Get has an advantage here. The, the traction control is variable and data processed. So what's happening is, is the RPM versus throttle position as RPM spikes relative to throttle position, which tells the, tells the system that you've got wheel spin, it will pull away ignition and fuel and tame back the, the wheel spin into, um, into uh, it'll, it'll scrub it off. And so why that's absolutely game changing is you've got a guy who is uh, riding a 500. This, is a, this bike's a monster, right? A 500 is a monster. Even a, even a 350, even a modern day, Four stroke 350 is a torque monster. So what you've got now is the ability to pull some of that power away in certain conditions that's automatic. You couple the get ECU with traction control and our Takamoto maps um, with the Recluse CX and some suspension work and some things like a steering stabilizer. Um, this bike happens to have the stock bars, but we're a big fan of the flex bars. Uh, so if you're a vet rider and you've got some wrist issues, we also really like the reflex racing uh, bar guards that have this little pivot point here. And so we're able to not add to the rigidity of the bars. We've, we, we, we neutralize, you know, all of the, all of the pinch points of a, of a guard system creates a, a secondary set of um, strength to the bars. And so we've got solid rigid bars and we've got a solid rigid hard mount bar guard system and we've just increased the uh, we've decreased rather I guess the flex capabilities of the bars <clears throat> so you know again you do things to a bike specific to the rider and what his desired outcomes are and then you've got a package that like I said with this rider we're trying to extend we don't, we're not he's not a racer I don't really care what the horsepower numbers are uh, you, you know you'll, you'll talk to guys or you'll watch videos and then they will they will hype up horsepower. I don't care about horsepower. Raw horsepower numbers in a lot of instances is a gimmick uh, marketing device. Uh, I will tell you, you can email me and I will tell you what the horsepower numbers are for certain maps, under certain conditions, with certain setups. There's so many variables that affect what the final rear rear horsepower numbers are. And to just, to just say that one component or one setup is the right way for everybody to go and then to market a specific horsepower number it, to me is utter nonsense. I don't do it. I have, an ex I have a completely opposite philosophy about that. So um, again, here we are not, this is not a podium rider. We're not trying to put this guy uh, on the podium of the Baja 1000 or anything. We're just trying to keep this guy on his bike for 
as long as possible. And these are all ways we're doing that. So um, we just, uh, uh, we're just absolute fans of aftermarket ECUs and, and rider specific tuning. That's really key. What kind of rider are you? What are you after? What are your goals for your setup of your bike? Let's create a package for you, specific to you, that will keep you on your bike um, and, and, and even keep you on the bike for, for more hours than you may otherwise have been able to do. Like all the time I'll talk to guys and you know they'll get three, four hours into a ride and they're spent, they're gassed out, but we'll do some specifically, uh, you will do some, some very carefully chosen mods and that'll add a couple hours per day to his um, his riding, um, so again, these are all just things that 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 all add up. Uh, the stock battery we pulled that out. The shore uh, well, this isn't a shore ride. This is a get. This is an Athena get battery, which we've been testing and, and are really liking a lot. The stock Sky Rich battery is 120 cold cranking amps. I think it's a four amp hour battery, and it's lithium ion. And we have seen those just just croak all of a sudden, without any warning, they'll just completely fail, they'll die. And uh, we, are, we don't like those. I don't run them in any of my bikes and I, I take them out. I've got a stack of them. Uh, if you want a stack, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that, but I was gonna say, if you want a, a free stock battery, I've got stacks of them. I'm not gonna send you a free battery. So we uh, really like the anti-gravity eight cell battery. I also am really starting to like and become a fan of these Get, Athena Get batteries. The, the 8-cell anti-gravity is a 240 cold cranking amp, and I think it's like 12, I should have looked at the numbers, um, I think it's like 12 watt, or 12 amp hours. So it's really, um, in, it's a huge step up, and it's also those, most of those, these aftermarket batteries, like this one, is lithium iron, not lithium ion, and you can do your own research. Lithium ion batteries are not as shock and vibration resistant as an iron battery is they the iron compounds and formula tends to be more um, just shock resistant and so on a bike we like the iron so there's some there's some uh, some understanding about what's going on with that he's got the IMS tank this is the I think it's like the 3.0 and then we've got the Takamoto vent right here with the cap and that allows him to put if he wanted to like a tank bag on there and it's vented off down into the into the normal way. We looked at the Scott stabilizer a minute ago and then we, we really like the BRP mounting, sub mount, that, that's kind of how we do these. And then we put in the soft blue, um, excuse me there, elastomers. As far as that goes, we looked at the reflex hand guards. And then this is trick, we've got the, um, uh, this is the, oh, what the hell, this is the, uh, a double take. There we go. It's a double take little mirror. And there's there's a problem with the stock mounting on the right hand side as far as the mirror goes. So when you get your bike and you got the big dumb ugly mirrors, there is a bracket here. There's a there's a there's a hole threaded bracket for the mirror. And the guys who put your bike together at the dealership will tend to take this and push it all the way forward. And that puts a really weird angle here on your throttle cables, pushes them super far forward, and then this thing is just at a weird, strange angle. Or you could run it all the way back, but if you do, you interfere with your start and stop, or your start switch, and we get rid of the stock setup, and then I use these um, over under, the sick ass over under start, start, stop switch, which is really great, frees up some bar space. And so we are releasing here in just a little bit a, 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 bra a new bracket assembly that will allow you to mount a mirror and leave the, leave the throttle cable here in the stock spot and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be releasing that pretty soon. We got the OD Rogue grips. These are lock-on. Big fans of these. We use the threaded bar inserts here so we've tapped out the inside of the bar and there's an aluminum threaded uh, insert that's threaded in there and then put Loctite on there and so this is going into the a solid rigid mount instead of one of those weird expanding sort of nut situations which are you know kind of hokey 
this is uh, super, super strong as far as that goes. These are the bulletproof levers. I've become more and more of a fan of these things. They've got great adjustability. I think they're just a really nice lever, good feel. Um, they do a good job. Fitment is absolutely flawless and they've got a nice flat profile for your fingers, which I like. I threw on, on this bike, the Enduro Engineering lever grips, or I forget what these are called, but these are basically kind of a traction-y, uh, there's some there's some stiction to that, I guess you would say, and that's just a heat shrink thing and you throw on there. And these come longer, and so I've trimmed these to fit and snug right in there in that little spot. I like that. We've got some fork leaders up here. Um, these are the fork shrinks. So these, you should know, these do not provide any protection other than maybe some rock dings. These are just, you know, they look good. These are a little bit of blingy things here. I like them. Um, uh, but if you need like really strong fort guard protection, then you're going to want to look at the dingoes, which we carry. These are just really to kind of dress up the bike. We had to relocate the key. The key used to be up in here and there's no room. This stuff would all interfere. So we relocated it down here with our, um, with our key relocator bracket. Enduro engineering is, is, is really one of our favorite choices for the radiator guard. And the reason is it comes all the way and covers the whole side of the radiator to the end of the radiator. Many, many really good radiator guards are very thin. So they do, and they offer fantastic front side protection, but very limited side protection. In fact, they may only be half of an inch or an inch, which leaves a ton of the radiator exposed and naked and vulnerable to getting uh, crushed by something you're gonna hit. If you hit it up here where there's protection, lucky you. If you happen to hit it further back, you're gonna smash that radiator. And I've seen a ton of guys with smashed radiators with the radiator guard and they're pretty bummed after they have to repair or replace the radiator. The Enduro Engineering takes care of that because of all of its sidewall protection. The only thing that I would say about the Enduro is I wish it came down further because if they could extend this down and wrap it around and secure it to the front of this, so the front of this might have to be lower, this side would come and extend further because you have a big vulnerability here. And I, on my own personal bike, running these radiator guards, have a smashed radiator, took a, took a, 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 a tree stump in Idaho right here. And I'm gonna continue to run that radiator. I'm not gonna change it, but I've got this issue. And then this hose is deformed and the angle is kind of cockeyed because it took, a, took, took something and then smashed it there where there is no protection. So that would be my only critique on the Enduro. Otherwise, I think it's, it's the way to go. Uh, let's see here. We threw on the Enduro Engineering, another Enduro product, the front um, axle puller. I like those. That's the Acherby's lower fork guards. Shinko 216 on the front. That's the fatty size. That's the big one. We've got moose on this bike. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. Moto Minded XL80, favorite light, adjustable. You can't go wrong with the Moto Minded setup. Terrific. Let's see, on the other side, we've got the double take. This is the scrambler side. I like the scrambler over the regular size mirror. The lollipop extension of the arm. Look at that rain in Vegas, crazy. Uh, and so it's smaller and I like this one. This is the Takomoto left hand master switch. Uh, a couple of things that it gives you is an off position. So if you want to turn off your headlight, you can do that. The running lights will stay on. Oh, fork wrap, fork wrap turn signals on the front. That's our own. Uh, product and then we've got the Canyon Dancer. This is the, the tie down straps. We've also desmogged this bike. Here's some of the plugs. We did not put the the in frame coolant tank overflow on this bike. It's not really needed. He's not going to be hardcore rock bashing this bike and he's he's going to be taking more fire roads and open stuff where he doesn't need that boil over protection. So we didn't bother doing that. But but this bike has been. Um, we have removed the SAS system. And um, since we're down here, so we've got the Takamoto uh, Slim Metal. These, these, these bikes come with a, a plastic fuel elbow. And so we've got the metal one here, and then it's a lower profile than the stock one. And then we've got the Golan inline fuel filter in the tank. We've, we've swapped out the stock plastic mall, mel, mall fuel filter and we've got the metal, um, our own metal fuel filter in there. And uh, so you can see that 
the tank here is lower than the stock one and so you, you instead of running this elbow on the inside which is how the stock one is you may have to run this on the outside i may come back later and reconfigure this i i would probably let me say it like this if this was a hardcore off-road uh, enduro bike i would i would reconfigure this so that this elbow would be on the inside to offer better protection i may not have gone through that uh, extra effort because this is just going to be like a bdr trail bike but not a bad idea to, to reconfigure and flip this. And so if you're running an aftermarket tank, don't be surprised if you need to cut some hoses, put some straight line hoses in there, do something to get your fuel, uh, your fuel lines reconfigured. You, you might need to get a little bit creative about that. We are looking into coming up with some, some um, pre-bent, some heat bent, hose kits that depending on which bike you have and which tank you're putting on it would be pre-formed to offer the most protection and then just be a sort of a plug and play solution so if you're intimidated by modifying hoses cutting hoses working with clamps doing all that it would be an all-in-one solution and you would just clamp it at the two ends here uh, on the inside and the outside and the rest of it would all be set up and situated for your bike and your tank size so that's something we're we're working on and hope to have that out soon the recluse we talked about that there's the slave cylinder beautiful work of art uh, we always take off uh, the dirt we well, we put on the dirt tricks dome washer so we take off the stock uh, dome washer because those seem to have a shelf life they only last a couple of years and then they lose their spring their preload it's the preload onto the sprocket that that compresses the oil seal inside of here and so if you've got a situation where oil is being slung out of your chain and you can't figure out where that's coming from it's coming from the fact that your dome washer is, uh, is gone weak and uh, the preload is gone and the oil seal now is uh, letting pressure pressurized oil bypass leak out and it's just being thrown and slung everywhere often you can fix that situation by simply and only swapping out and putting on this dirt trick dome washer which is uh, uh, hardened steel tool steel and you don't have to tear this apart you don't have to do anything else so if you've got a leaky seal my first recommendation would be don't dig into this just change your dome and see if that fixes it and almost always i hear back from guys that, that say it does it fixes it straight away if you've got an exc bike a 17 plus exc bike your your this is the stock uh, primary sprocket and uh, there is a rubber sound damp damper ring that goes around here it serves no other purpose than to cushion the chain against the sprocket and to reduce some of the sound for the epa 50 mile an hour drive-by test so if you're going to install this you have to remove that ring because the inner diameter of the stock the id of the stock dome is smaller than the id or the OD rather of the the dirt trick, and so you can't it's you can't you can't leave that on. You got to dig it off. You got to cut it off. What I'll typically do is once I pull this nut off, then I'll just get in there with the razor blade, cut it out, pliers, rip it out, um, pull it out from the bottom any way you can. I, I don't I don't go through the effort of removing the sprocket to remove that. I'll just cut it and pull it and get that thing out of there. You may also look at changing your primary sprocket uh, bolt this thing has one or two removals and reinstallations and then i recommend replacing it maybe after every second use because it will stretch i've seen these break and snap and the bolt is now inside of the output shaft of the transmission and uh, that is absolute drama and grief and you can avoid all that if you change this bolt absolutely make sure you tighten it to spec use a mild uh, thread locker uh, I don't recommend the red use the like blue don't be crazy with how much you put on and also when you're gonna remove this if if it's stuck and it's not coming off easy heat that use a uh, flame torch take this off so you don't melt it or burn it but you can take a torch and very carefully heat this up be aware of the flame and if you're uncomfortable with that use an electric heat heat uh, like a paint stripper heat gun but you need to heat that up maybe 200 degrees and then you could start turning that out and it'll come it'll that'll release the thread locker uh let's see anything else interesting back here we've got the bulletproof designs this is the swing arm guard the, there's the two anchor points right here are kind of vulnerable to rock hits and um, so we like to put this on why not this is the uh, ddc rear 
sprocket with the warp 9 titanium bolts that's for no other reason than just they look super rad come on the ddc with the titanium warp nines that's like incredible that looks super damn good so that's what we put on there and this is the stock gearing this is the 40 what the, what the hell is the stock gearing 1448 i think on the 20 plus bikes used to be super tall the 17 17 through 19s it was like 1545 which is 100 i think that stock bike we ran those up to like 100 and i don't know 11 or 14 miles an hour and that was just to pass the drive-by test uh, they've been able to reduce sound through other methods and so they've got this the newer bikes are more geared to uh, uh, off-road use rather than just trying to pass that test with the higher speed gearing so i think that's a that's a nice improvement that's a good change uh, where did the seat go? We threw the seat concepts on here. This is the low. Our rider is not particularly tall. Uh, it's got a lower center of gravity for him as far as when he's sitting. Up here on the bars, we've got, uh, he's got this ram mount for his phone. And then, it's not my favorite. I don't love this. These things come off. I've been on rides where I've lost these things and that's kind of a drag and uh, the rubber bands thing i think it's good i like the concept of it i uh, you know i don't have a favorite phone grabber i i probably like the hondo um, hondo garage one um, we didn't use that one this is the one that the owner had thrown on there but the hondo garage i think is a really good one voyager pro with the stout mount moto minded stout mount as far as securing that to the top of the bracket that's one of our favorite ways to go let me take a, just a quick little overview, see if we forgot anything. If we did, it's probably not that important. Um, so there you go. This is our walkthrough. This is a 21500 EXCF and uh, a, a thoughtful, uh, oh, here's a little thing we threw on for this guy. Here's a little battery tender. And then this, so the battery tender and the Voyager Pro, here's something I forgot to mention that was worth noting, especially here about the electrical system. So we've done a couple of things to this bike, and we do this to most of our dual sport bikes. We put on an accessory relay that is, that is energized <clears throat> from the bike run signal. So when the engine is running, the relay closes. Um, the hot side of the relay comes off of the battery, and then the contacts, the output side, the control side of the relay, then sends switched power up front. And so on this bike, we are powering the uh, again, we're powering the, where, where did that thing go? We're powering the USB little phone charger doodad right here, okay? That's being powered off of the bike run signal as well as the Voyager Pro. And then he's got the ability now if he wants to add heated grips or any other accessories up here in the cockpit that would, that would cycle on with the bike run signal. We can do that now because of our accessory relay that we've added on there, that we've put on there. And then the other thing that we did is we put on a starting capacitor, a Tokyo off-road starting capacitor. So if the battery on this bike ever completely failed outright, just took a total catastrophic dump, you know, that's rare, but it could happen. This bike will not run. These, these fuel injector bikes, the KTMs especially, will not run if the battery is removed. And you could do a little test. Uh, start your bike, remove the ground or the, or the positive, it doesn't matter. I'd remove the ground, it's safer. Remove the ground from your bike and your bike will die instantly. <clears throat> and that's because the um, signal, the ECU, needs to have a voltage reference to run. And one of the workarounds to prevent a complete st being stranded with a completely knackered battery would be to add on that little small starting capacitor. So in this side panel right here, you, you can't see any of this, but, but in here and zip tied and hidden away is the Wi-Fi module for the Get ECU, the relay for the, ex for the powered accessories, and here's the fuse for that. It goes down in there and is hidden away. And then the starting capacitor. All that stuff lives under here. You don't need to see it. You don't need to access it. You don't need to service it. And so it lives in there. And then on this side, obviously this is the air filter, we've got the PC Racing uh, filter skin over the top of the twin air air filter, and then the PC Racing filter gasket. That's what's going on there. And then the uh, tidy tail, the, that, that loom on the 2021 bikes comes in here, and then it's a very easy to access connect, connection point right there. So those are just a couple of quick things going on with the electrical system on this bike. Just to wrap up, um, 
Let us know in the comments if you have any questions about this bike or any of the bikes we feature, any of the products that we offer and sell or setting up your own bike. We're happy to talk to you. If you've got a bike that uh, has been set up by anybody else and you'd like some recommendations or some feedback on ways to improve what you have or to add to what you have or to get yourself set up um, from scratch, we, uh, we can help you in any way that you're looking, looking for. So thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe, and as always, go out and get some adventure.